Welcome to my stories. The 1980s. 17. In June of 1981, I graduated from Stamford Catholic High School in Stamford, Connecticut, only three weeks after my dad dropped dead suddenly from a massive heart attack. I can barely remember the summer of 1981. More accurately, though, the events of that summer are so deeply and indelibly etched in my mind, I prefer not to remember them. As a child, typography came naturally to me. Having artistic inclinations early on, I was fascinated with drawing letters and words in different fonts, copying the letter forms from Encyclopedia Britannica, and writing poetry and letters in different typefaces and calligraphy. I spent many meditative hours in the act of gracefully swirling a nibbed pen across satiny vellum, the deep black ink flowing forth, creating the smooth, slinky curves and flourishes of the scripts. The practice soothed me and brought a deep sense of peaceful satisfaction. I felt as if the pieces of my mind suddenly clicked and I was whole. I delighted in forming letters and words into subtle and aesthetically beautiful creations. I was safe in this little world where I was in control. I had found a creative, peaceful place of solitude inside myself, which would become a place of refuge for me in the years to come. The day before my dad died, I started the part-time typesetting job I had won because of my fast typing ability, which parlayed itself into being the launching pad for my career to this day. After dinner that night, we sat on the front porch together, like we often did, to talk about our day and watch the cars roll by. He asked me if I thought I'd like my new job. I told him with eyes wide that I'd be working side by side with the artists who got to play with magic markers and exacto knives, at drawing tables, designing books and cover artwork. Until then, I had no clue that type of job actually existed, but there it was, right in front of me. Without hesitation, I brazenly announced to him that I was going to be a graphic artist. I went to bed with a purpose that night. After school the next day, I excitedly rushed off to my new job again, and I stayed past five so I could experiment with my new toy, the CompuGraphic typesetting machine that allowed me to cast my name in an array of fonts and sizes. It was after hours and I was alone in the office when the phone next to my desk started ringing. For some reason, it sent a shiver down my spine and I was afraid to pick it up. Spooked for whatever reason, I quickly picked up my backpack and ran out there. My dad died that afternoon while I was at work. Unbeknownst to me, I stopped at his gas station to see him on my way home, but he had already been taken away in an ambulance. I didn't show up at my job the next day. But my employers were surprised when I did show up the day after that. And the day after that, I had made a commitment. I had accepted a job. It was the only thing in my life that provided a flimsy reason for me to wake up. So I kept going back every day. After all, it felt good to make things and playing with typefaces and words provided that familiar solace and inspiration I remembered from my earlier creative endeavors. It delighted me like a spark in the darkness. Then at 17, I somehow mustered the chutzpah to get my employer to foot the bill for me to take classes at Parsons School of Design in New York City. I turned 18 that November, and by then I found myself in the working world full time, a fledgling professional typographer by day and a student learning the trade of graphic design at Parsons by night. If the heartache seemed to fade with time, it was a good act. By all appearances, things seemed idyllic. But inside myself, I was frantically searching to find something to grab onto to survive. Driven by fear that I refused to admit, running full speed ahead to save my life from the steering pain that was killing me. With blinders on so nothing would distract me from my mission. I was in full survival mode. The devastation of my father's death catapulted me straight into the orbit I was on, and nothing was going to stop me from trying to escape that earth-shattering sadness engulfing me. I needed a safe place to hide, and I found it in my craft. It became my drug, my reason to exist. What a great and noble distraction. 
And my happy justification was, I got paid to do it too. My best girlfriend Karen and I discovered one fairly harmless way to escape the stresses of our real worlds on weekends. We jump in my Firebird convertible and jaunt down to Virginia Beach where time seemed to stand still for us. There we could let loose and flirt and play with those sweet southern boys we called the BLHs, aka the blonde long hairs. That was before I got married at 20 to my childhood sweetheart, who worked at my dad's gas station as a mechanic. The day after our wedding, we moved to Virginia Beach, only to head back to Stanford within the year to move in with my mother-in-law and her literally ankle-biting Pomeranian yap dog. July 1982. This was my brand new Camaro Z28 parked on the strip near the boardwalk in Virginia Beach, Virginia. It was my first ever brand new car that I bought fresh off the dealer lot when I was 19. I removed all the stickers and logos that came from the factory and hand painted the custom pinstriping in three shades of blue and silver. This photo at Virginia Beach Oceanfront. 1983, cruising the strip in Virginia Beach. It was my favorite spot to escape to for some crazy fun weekends. And it was only an easy eight hour drive from Stamper, Connecticut to stay with my cool cousins who live there, Janice and John Farrell. This photo at Virginia Beach Oceanfront. Spring 1984, here's my best friend Karen in the passenger seat. We were so spoiled, her boyfriend Boris let her take his shiny new Porsche 944 to Virginia Beach whenever we wanted to make that midnight cruise down the Jersey Turnpike. Notice I got to do the driving. This photo at Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. 1984. The other thing I did when I was 20 was get married to my first husband, Alex. This picture was taken after we moved back to Stamford, Connecticut from Virginia Beach and had to live with Alex's mother. I was 21 in this photo. This was my cat, Jersey, who I found at a rest stop on the New Jersey Turnpike on one of our weekend jaunts. Photo is from Stamford, Connecticut. 1987. Sometime between the last photo and this one, I split up with my husband. This photo was taken at the infamous 48 West Norwalk Road House, our great roomy art and music house in Norwalk, Connecticut. Here I am with my cat Panama, named after the Van Halen song of the same name. Photo at West Norwalk, Connecticut. 1989. After settling into 48 with Chris and Karen, we tried our hand at a Halloween party, which set the bar for many more notorious home parties to come. This was the year of Batman and the Joker, and Chris and Karen's brother Michael played the parts. 1989, Dave and Lisa, my roommate Karen's sister and brother-in-law in West Norwalk, Connecticut. Another from Halloween 1989, my two roommates, Karen and Chris. 1989, Max the cat and Chris in the front yard of 48. This was right about the time I gave my two week notice to my job and decided that within that time, I would move across the country to Los Angeles, California, sight unseen. Photo at West Rock, Connecticut. So two weeks later after quitting my job, Chris offered to hop in my little black car to escort me on my westward journey, and so we did. This was the first time I would experience the country this intimately, from coast to coast. I've done that ride now five times over, twice flying solo with my two happy cats, Dino and Kyle. I'll do it again. Did I hear someone say road trip? Photo somewhere in Utah. Independence Pass, Colorado, at dusk on the eve of 4th of July. I stopped at the Continental Divide to see the sunset with Chris. As I ran out to see the view from the edge of the cliff, I was suddenly overcome sobbing and shaking beyond my control. Moved by the insane, wild beauty of it all, I had never experienced such immensity before in my life. Photo in Independence Pass, Aspen, Colorado. 
July 4th, 1989. Holed up in Aspen, Colorado for two party nights replete with the holy trinity of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And yes, fireworks. Here we picnicked at Maroon Bells by day. The mountain can be faintly seen in the background. Photo at Maroon Bells and Maroon Lake in Aspen. We touched down in Los Angeles and made it to Judy and Brian's house in West Hollywood just in time for pizza. We made the trek in three days time, driving about 15 hours each day. Photo from Beverly Hills, West Hollywood, Brian and Judy's house. My first Los Angeles self-portrait, taken on the floor in Brian's spare room where I was sleeping for a while. There was no such thing as selfies back then. You had to position the camera and press the button, then run in front of it and pause quickly. Photo at Beverly Hills, West Hollywood. Here's a picture of my cool LA friends, Brian, Judy, Jay, and Diana at the darkest bar in West Hollywood called Ports. Here's mom with me at SeaWorld in San Diego the night before I would drive cross country with her to go back to Connecticut. Here's mom enjoying her first trip across the country at the New Mexico, Arizona state line. This photo is somewhere in Texas with mom at I-20 eastbound. I made it back to Stanford, Connecticut, just in time to be with the old gang for Christmas and to see about things with this guy. Happy times at Christmas. I'm still clueless about things. You can tell by the giant naive smile on my face. Photo in Japan at Stanford, Connecticut. New Year's Eve, 1989, the turn of a new decade. I had just found out this afternoon that he broke up with his other girlfriend that day and needed me, his best friend, to console him. Well, that's not going to happen tonight, nor will it stop the New Year's Eve festivities from commencing. So off we flew into the 90s. Happy New Year's, folks.